It's Survivor's Friendly Fire Show, episode 235 for the start of April 2023. Uh, we're not doing April Fools, even though we are a couple of fools. I'm one of your co-hosts, Steve Wright, joining me, Ben Salter. Hey, Ben, you're technically in Tokyo at, at the sound of this recording, but we're pretending uh, that you're not. Maybe. I'm on, a, I'm on a plane if you're listening to this at the time that it's, it's come out and been released. If you listen to it later, then yes, maybe I'm in Tokyo. But now I'm here. I'm here right now. That's the main thing. That is extremely evident <laughs> yeah. um and let's we've got a lot to talk about so let's get into it you know what's not here right now e3 e3 2023 has officially been canceled in both its digital and physical forms uh the esa the the governing body responsible for the production or not the production i guess the the cumul- culmination of e3 uh together with Repop, who is going to be the producer of this year's event, both just said, nah, we're, we're done. And that's, of course, because of what we talked about last week. Big hitters like Nintendo, Microsoft, well, and yeah, Sony, Activision, EA, everyone basically, Sega, Tencent, have, have said, nah, we're good, we're going to do our own thing. So there's not really a need for E3 2023, really. Yep. They're all out. So there is no, if there's no one to actually attend and be on the showroom floor, there is no E3. Which is a little disappointing. So I think we, we recap this every time we talk about E3, but E3 isn't the press conferences that you see at home as much as... I mean, that's super fun. I mean, that would be our everyone's beginning, our first experience of E3, staying up all night and watching them all, which used to be a big thing. Um, but that's not E3. That's the conferences before E3. And then the actual E3 itself is kind of a massive convention at the LA Convention Center where you get to go and actually see all these games, chat to devs, play stuff. Uh, and that is what is no more. So I'm sure you'll still get, and I think a lot of them have said we're going to do our own digital events and things. Announcements will still happen. It's just all that info that you'd get post those conferences probably won't happen because we're not going to have a bunch of people going hands-on, chatting to devs, people kind of slipping up and saying things they shouldn't have, which is where all the juiciest stuff came from. Exactly. Um, and even before, like I, before I started doing this, video games journalism thing myself like e3 was always an exciting time because you had to especially as as i am far older than you um you had to wait for the information before before the internet was a thing people would go to la and see these games literally behind closed doors because they weren't being live streamed and there wasn't a press conference that was being broadcast out to the masses it was people going and making appointments with publishers and with developers to see things to maybe get hands-on maybe to you know watch a presentation by the developer and then to go back and write about it for their magazine or their very you know early era internet website kind of thing so there was an absolute need for for e3 just for that reason, to, to spin yeah. up the hype machines when that was literally the hype machine. That was, you know, th- oh, three weeks later or something, whenever your latest issue went to print. And people would have different info. So there wasn't kind of one thing being announced and then like so well-trained media people that they would kind of regurgitate the same information in a bunch of interviews, which is what happens now. Like they, they, these people get so much training, they, they know what they're going to say and very rarely do they say something different and give exclusives beyond like the absolute massive US publications. <laughs> uh, but it used to be different because it was people would see the same presentations, but then they would chat to people and they would just kind of talk about it and it was kind of less controlled in that way. Uh, and then the, you would hear nothing and like three or four weeks later, the magazines would come out and they would have different takes on stuff that were quite different, different background information. Sometimes a bunch would report on something because it was what was said in the conference and then someone else would kind of have the scoop on actually they meant this, they said the wrong thing or they made it sound like the wrong thing and it's actually this. Uh, And a bunch of stuff kind of was speculated on but it was almost reported like it was fact because it's just how it came across at the time. No opportunity to clarify things. Um, Totally different. But like I remember getting those like E3 issues of like Hyper and even mags before that, like the N64 era magazines, even the SNES magazines. Uh, and it was it was amazing to kind of go through it and read, like get this new information. It was the only place to get it and so different to now. Well, and yeah, like you, you weren't seeing the gameplay yourself. So the, you know, the three or four hmm. screenshots that were in the magazine were literally the only ways for you to gain access to what this new yeah. Zelda could look like or whatever you wanted to talk about sometimes real screenshots too like actually someone playing and like a dodgy photo of like a crt screen like that was the (laughs) screenshot that's the best kind um and i and it's a different news cycle as well like you know not that this is what i was thinking about as in terms of a memory you know back as a child because i wouldn't have had a clue but you know like you had 
time to breathe. You weren't, you know, running out of a conference room or something, you know, trying to get that scoop before the person who sees it 20 minutes after you or whatever. Like, you had some time to digest mm. as the writer and, you know, really figure out what you wanted to highlight. And it was probably, well, there's, it's, that's, it's very wrong to paint such a generalist brush saying, you know, oh, the, the, the content was better in that manner. But, you know, it's, it was probably a little bit easier for deadlines and for, for the, uh, the stress levels of the writer. Absolutely. <laughs> you probably had one person doing more stuff. Like I suspect now, knowing how, knowing how it works, that you'd have someone uh, somehow funded to go across, self-funded or sent across by someone, and they probably did write for you know one or two magazines, but then maybe they wrote for actually, like normally, but maybe they wrote at E3 for five or six because they were there, so they got commissioned to do stuff, and you're probably doing a lot. But yes, you'd have way longer lead time uh, probably longer form content as well for some stuff like the real big reveals you really need to paint the picture of what it is because there's no video to go with it there's not many screens there's just that old school like rendered art which there was time to get because there was that such a lag between seeing it and the magazine going to print yeah um, but then there would be stuff where there's just no space so something that was you thought was really cool that you'd now get a whole preview on might have just gotten like 50 words because it was just yeah. like in the little recap of overall stuff that we saw and that's it so Good and bad, but there's more scope to, to get stuff out there. But certainly the the big hit of information is is no more in that way. Yeah, it's so wild just the things you take for granted now. Like like you were saying, you, you couldn't write something and say, oh, you know, like you've seen the trailer that came out last week. It's on YouTube or like th yeah. that, that wasn't there. Like there's stuff that we didn't ever get to see really in, cause only because Capcom kind of screwed up with Resident Evil 4 is a good example like that Resident Evil 3.5 build which was way spookier like that there was no trailer there was there was nothing like that you know Capcom had to make a, a disc and ship it with another Capcom product to get it into people's hands you couldn't just go to the internet and pull up whatever you wanted so there was it was a, a, a different time yeah very different and they <clears throat> even the conference structure is so different if you do go back and watch like someone's camcorder VHS like the first E3 1995 or even the five or so years after that uh, like the structure of the conference is not that quick snappy game 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 that we've got now there was like a good half an hour of let's talk exec chat like here's figures here's stats and then they would often just have a few minutes like at the end of and now we're just going to drop an absolute bombshell of this big news story from someone who's a total businessman it's nothing to do with this game that he's announcing all this better yet console or something and it was just like oh yeah here's our console 399 whatever, like whatever the magic number is uh and they were like big moments but it was that had to be relayed and it was yeah as we say like you'd read about it weeks later and it was this big deal yeah. there's no twitter to get that out and yet the it still got out there but it was yeah just so different and it was the only way for this stuff to happen like there were a few other shows gamescom popped up a bit later there was tgs as well uh but nothing was like E3, like it was just a special no. time of you, even not going at all, just kind of following it weeks later, you knew there'd be big stuff coming out. It was exciting to know it was happening because you'd learn a few weeks later that something big is coming. Yeah. And I guess we're, we're, we're we'll get into our own experiences, like uh, having actually attended, but like there's things that you know now that you, that you didn't know it back at the time. And one, I guess it was... It, 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 uh, apart from the games that were being shown, it's like a networking event, especially for you know people that aren't necessarily mm. based in the U.S. Like it's a, it's an opportunity to 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 meet people in terms of colleagues, in terms of like the big wig you know PR people you know based out of the U.S. or maybe even depending on where you are, like you're based in Brisbane or something, and you flew yourself up. Now you're actually meeting the people running all the stuff in sydney um and there's a big buying component as well which i'm not sure how that even works nowadays because obviously that's that's going to be impacted but you know like up, yeah. up in the conferences there's other meeting rooms and things and that's where you know the the big wigs not the big wigs the sales executives perhaps at jb hi-fi would meet with square enix and decide how many units of final fantasy 7 they were going to be buying and bringing yeah. into the store which is probably a bad example let's say eb games because i don't think did jb exist then doesn't matter you know what i'm trying to get at at some point yeah and that's that's why they the conferences which were never intended to be live streamed in those early days and they weren't they were just kind of recorded uh and not even officially just we just kind of have off you know the few fans who somehow got in often did that because media was still this is early laptop days so some of them are probably taking handwritten notes um and a bunch of the room is executives. A lot of them are buying people. They are people 
going there to see what is on offer from you know these big publishers how much space should we give it how much should we buy yeah and that would have been a huge thing back then like now uh you know resident evil 4 comes out it sells three million copies in two days kind of a given they didn't do that much marketing for it certainly doesn't matter what place it gets on the store shelf in eb games or gamestop or jb hi-fi it's gonna sell yeah but back in in the early well the mid to late 90s and early 2000s that would have been a big deal like is your game getting prominent spot in the stores and one of those remember those like you'd have the demo kiosks like is it going to have one of those that like, to get one of those would have been a big deal and like a, one of the cardboard displays like uh that mattered as much as anything else i think but we didn't really see that as fans you didn't really care about that but that was a big part of why it existed yeah well do we get to talk about our actual experiences as as journalists instead of just enthusiasts or fans yeah yeah well that was that was all what we thought of it before we went <laughs> so what did what did you think before you actually got there so 2012 we both went to the same one that was our first the first one that we both went to what were you thinking it was going to be like before you went um i was pretty naive and there's so many aspects to that. The first thing is, which I think is just hilarious, like you go and I, like if you go and look at my Twitter, you can see all the different badges. And I think the the very first thing that I did was I went and picked up my badge. So you had to go and collect it. You get a lanyard. Mm-hmm. I think it, it was a it's usually an it usually was a Nintendo lanyard with like a sticky outy bit that's you know a little cardboard insert that's not your name and your Toss outlet. That. Well, I didn't. I was super ha- proud to have it. And I think it was, it was probably Steve Fairley from Oz Gamers who said, oh, no, 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 you got to get rid of that. That's just, what are you doing? Like, you just look the like an idiot. Like, yeah, okay, sorry. Okay, we'll get rid of that. And then, you know, like, that's the beauty thing. Like, in subsequent years when new people were coming, like, that was this, this like, psst, psst, get rid of that thing. Just, you don't want to look like an idiot. Um, and I think I kind of, like, I booked a couple appointments and I think I just thought I'd get by on my, like, charisma or something and, like, want to see this that and the other and like i it was it, i had a good time but i didn't book nearly as much or i didn't try to book or pre-book nearly as much as i should have i think is is the lesson learned for me um what what, what was your kind of first couple hours on the ground uh same thing getting the badge is like the the massive trick i think it's also the first time in LA, at least it was for me, and I think it would be for a lot of Australians, especially going to E3. And so dealing with that initially is like how massive this place is and how like strange it is uh, and not at all what you think LA is going to be. So you get past that first, then you get to the massive convention center and trying to figure out your way around. And, you know, three or four E3s in, you know exactly where you're going and you know the shortcuts, you know the ways to go to avoid all the people. But the first year you don't. So, so much... Certainly, probably, I would say the first two years, I did book quite a lot in, more so the, the latter years, um, and not realizing things are actually quite far apart, and you need to allow time for that. So and no matter how hard you try, you always book, like, the opposite convention hall the for your set. Yeah, there's two halls there, so they're actually quite spaced out. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think definitely the, the actually attending the press conferences in person was the most exciting part. So as much as you did get to go... Um, and then see all these games and play them afterwards and walk around the showroom floor. Uh, being there in person with all the just other people who are as excited as you and some less, some more. Um, and yeah, and kind of being there and having things announced in person in front of you, like these people who, uh, uh, and it certainly changed who was on stage. Like early years, it was still a mix of execs and kind of actual developers and things. And it definitely by the end of it, the last few live shows we went to, is like all developers. Maybe yeah. you get like, at most you get your Phil Spencer type kind of head executive and then the rest is kind of people who make the games. Definitely a shift there. But yeah, very cool actually seeing them announced in front of you live. Even though you're seeing the same thing you'd get at home, just different vibe. Well, and it's not three in the morning and, and hopefully well, you've had time. it's like three in the morning. You've flown in the day before. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's the bad thing, especially like 12 or 10 years ago god it's been so long like the the flights from australia you'd get in to la at like six in the morning and you mm. if you were like me you didn't sleep on the plane and you get to your hotel and they're like well you can't check in for like a good four more hours so like i don't know just like walk aimlessly around the streets of downtown la which itself is yeah. terrifying and i think we've gone into stories about the characters that we've met on the street in in subsequent or in earlier podcasts but like what you were saying about the press conferences i think sony was probably the 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 most resistant to change in those first couple years yeah because it it was at the i was always at the end of the day 
and it was like the here's like an hour and a half with food trucks and alcohol and it's been a long day anyway and then you you know get a little bit you know tipsy and you've got a full belly and you go into this really dark arena and sony exec talk for like 25 minutes where they just looked talking about stats and numbers and guaranteed it was like hot in that place Lies. i was sleepy yeah. like that was like i had a little snooze like unintentional i didn't mean to it's very disrespectful but i just couldn't i couldn't help it and that it, that, that little segment was happening in sony press conferences for a couple more years and then eventually they kind of yeah. dropped it for more of the showy everybody's they watching on the internet yeah. you don't want to you don't want to listen to this stuff kind of stuff that, yeah, that's how long ago we first started going. It was before the live stream was considered the big deal. It was still kind of like, oh, we can stream this now. I can't. I don't know what the first year they would have streamed it would have been or would have been like all of them being streamed. Maybe like 2009, 10 or something like that. Certainly mid-2000, I'm going to say they weren't all streamed if anywhere at all. Uh, and our internet wouldn't have been able to do it until about 2010. Yeah, um, yeah I, I can't remember. So Sony was still on that old mindset probably until 2014. Until the certainly the PS3 conferences, yes, they were still on that. It's for the the buyers and the execs first, and then we know there's some media in the room who report on this stuff way later. And I think they kind of twigged around then that actually this gets more people are watching at home. People are kind of talking about this immediately. We need to pivot into that way, yeah. which is very much how they do their conferences now. Uh, and they probably ended up with the best format. Um, but when we yeah when we first started going, I'd probably say that Xbox had the best format in that they were very. Um, well, they were the start of the day, so they had the advantage of us while we were at our most alert, having flown in the day before, and you've had to get up for this and race to it. Uh, former host of the show, Tano, definitely missed it the year we went to the first year we went together in 2013. He claimed to not hear me knocking on his door or something. Um, I'm surprised he was alive. So hey, like if if that's the bar, he's he's surpassed expectations. So that's good at least. Yeah. Uh, and I would say they, by that point, 2012, even 2013, they had their format, which they kind of stuck with until the end, pretty well down, which was less exec numbers chat, but still a bit too too many execs on stage and like, oh, we need to have like a car come up at some point or we've got like, I don't know, some rapper I've never heard of do a performance mid-show. They got rid of that stuff later on. So they were trying to be a bit more showy, but they still were anti-games a bit for it. They felt yeah. like they needed to have other stuff in there. Uh, and then Nintendo was always the next day. So they were always Tuesday morning and they only lasted a couple of years before they went to Directs when we started going. I think they probably had the best early years because they were very reliant on their known figures. So Reggie and Iwata, who at least we knew who they were and they had kind of public personas and they played into those pretty well. And yes, yeah, sometimes they got on a bit of a tangent about here's the vitality sensor and we didn't understand what it was. And then sometimes they had like cool Reggie moments, which were like, my body is ready. Yeah. So, and you always got to get the street passes like we were talking about last week. And it was just kind yeah. of fun. And it was that it's that Nintendo style, like, please understand, uh, like tr- translation language barrier that's kind of sometimes getting in the way, which like just always ended up making whoever was speaking look adorable <laughs> rather than like... You know, you, you understood what they were saying, but it was just like, oh, tee So it was, that was a, yeah. a pleasant well, one to get to. Certainly one of the few who had a, uh, would often have someone come out live. It would be Miyamoto or someone of that level, like pretty high up at the company who would come out and be like, hi, everyone. Uh, and then be like, please understand, uh, that's the extent of my English. And then they'd have Bill <laughs> Trinan would come out and he would be the translator being like, thank you, Mr. Miyamoto. And then like, they would just present in Japanese and he would do a great job of talking like pretty quickly after to translate. Now, I'm sure this is well rehearsed and his lines were also on the teleprompter. It wasn't like he was like direct, oh, that's what you said. Like it was well rehearsed, but it didn't necessarily feel like that. And it was kind of like no one else did that. At that point, people were like, we don't really need to do that anymore. We can just have one of our, you know, this is in America. We can have yeah. one of our American execs do this. But Nintendo was still like, nah, Miyamoto's the man. Like we're going to put Oh, him yeah. He's like, you, you don't need to bring uh, Bill Gates or, you know, The Rock or uh, a Forza-featured yeah. car onto the stage. But, like, you just need to bring the big wigs. And, like, I think Phil Spencer's probably at that kind of level now. Yeah. And I think maybe Jim, not Jim Ryan, Sean Layden was kind of like that for Sony at the end. But, like, Nintendo already knew that. Like, oh, here's Miyamoto. Here's Reggie. Like, there, that's, we don't need, here's guest speaker someone. Weirdly, though, Ubisoft went the other way. I think they had really strong press conferences at the start and they got progressively worse as the years continued and i think the reason why is they stopped using aisha tyler who was just like one of those nerd or nerd adjacent people who clearly know what they're talking about they not may not be like fully like 
completely invested in video games, but like smart and switched on enough to know what was going on and not feel like she was reading cards that she didn't understand. Um, yeah. Because Eve Gilmo like is not that star power that we were just talking about. Aisha Tyler definitely was, and I was really disappointed when they dropped her for the press conferences that always had that weird like. 10 minutes of dancing neon bear just dance action going too much of that <laughs> yeah they were strong when they had her and i think they that was one playing to the fact that it was to a live audience so you need that audience to be kind of somewhat you know you feed energy off them there are some awkward e3 moments that are on you can kind of watch where it's just like someone's up on stage being like hey everyone are you ready to party and it's just some guys in suits being like no. <laughs> and they still kind of go like there's a few minutes like that yeah um yeah, but like she was, she did a good job of kind of perking up the audience, getting them excited, realizing that most of the Ubisoft executives who would come on the stage, and only a few of them would, but the ones who could, you know, English is their second language, they have a pretty thick French accent, which can be hard to understand, especially for Americans. I feel like Americans are not good at understanding non-American accents. They like very confused by it. Um, and so, yeah, having having someone who can present well, no, like, is interested in this stuff. It's not just a paid presenter, yeah. Uh, but with some personality, like, I feel like some of the some of the similar awards. I won't name any of them. Sometimes have a presenter who's a little bit dead. Like, yeah. and it's just it's it doesn't quite have that. Uh, well, and so, the yeah, media did a good job. The, the the media trained execs can read from a teleprompter just fine, and they can keep to the script just fine, but as soon as like a technical glitch or something goes wrong, they're kind of like a deer in headlights, and it happened to Aisha Tyler, and she is so charismatic that she just kind of ran with it, and it, was, it wasn't it was cringy, it was just kind of like, ha ha ha, this is funny. So, if Ubisoft does something, I just hope that man, that, like she's somehow surprise host, because that would be money well spent on Ubisoft's part, instead of randomly yeah. chat uh not chat uh ai driven npc dialogue creation tools did you hear about that like me for me just no. completely oh, I see, yes, tangent I did. I did. Yes, yeah yes, yes. um i i think no, ubisoft, don't, ubisoft don't use chat gpt to write your next conference <laughs> it'll it'll sound like yeah it'll sound like one of your execs getting up there just yeah, I think it will sound pretty natural for them. Yeah. But it's not what you want. I was always glad that Ubisoft, so Ubisoft and EA traditionally in the early, the, at least the first half of the time that we went, were kind of in the middle. So you'd have Xbox and you'd have those two, then you'd have Sony and then you'd have Nintendo the next day. And I was always glad they were there because otherwise it was would get a bit too like console versus console or platform versus platform. Yeah. And it was nice to have the, the big third parties in the middle to kind of be like, we're not really... I mean, they would have their marketing alliance on one platform, but it was still like a little bit of now we're all coming together for a bit and then we're going to the other platform. Yeah. Well, uh, and so, yeah, good to have that. EO wasn't as strong. They, they were probably more early day Sony. They would have someone come up and chat about numbers. They were more on that. Whereas Ubisoft were a bit more fun. And then, yeah, that was the early years, later years, Bethesda came in and they were like, we're the new kids on the block. Let's have blink one, eight, two. I think they were a bit like, let's go back. Let's take E3 back to the nineties. Yeah. And they, they kind of did. Well, and yeah, like that's, and it's kind of getting into maybe why things, you know, signs that things were starting to kind of like peak and, and decline, but maybe let's get into that because we're almost, we're like 25 minutes in, maybe we'll get into that next week, I think, because there's still a ton to talk about. I don't yeah. want a long, I don't want a long episode. Let's do the, do the second half. Maybe we'll just wrap up this week with some of the, some of the real key moments of when it was at its peak. So like the big things to come out of E3 were probably before we attended, it was like, the biggest E3 moment, I would say, would be the the PS1 price drop when they just came in like $100 less than Sega. Uh, now, that's a huge... I think that's why Sony loved having that end-of-day time slot. Like So by the time we were going, Sega didn't have a press conference, but they had that moment where they just came in and they... What was it? 299, the magic number. That's how they started their press conference, which must have felt so different. So they everyone was expecting the half an hour, I'm sure, just... I'm just assuming what people would have expected in 1995, <laughs> six, five. It was the first E3. Um, they would have expected the big long exec chat, and the guy just walked up the stage and he just goes 2.99 and walks away and got massive cheer. That bit was filmed. That would have been amazing to be there. Basically killed Sega. Like they they had another crack after that, but like that was the that one moment was the end for them. Uh, I think that moment's not going to be topped in gaming at all. Like there's just that's not possible to do that now. Like everything is so tightly structured. You don't have a live audience. Um, that would have been pretty cool. 
I also think Nintendo showing Super Mario 64 for the first time would have been pretty cool. Like, just coming from the 2D era, just like, here's Mario in 3D. Like, that would have been mind-blowing for the people there at the time. Again, something that you don't, you couldn't get now because it would just be a trailer online. It's not having to physically go somewhere and watch it on screen. So, yeah, yeah, that level of announcement we won't get again. That was That was when it was at its best. Or even the jump to, from like you know Xbox to Xbox 360 and PS2 to PS3, like that we we don't mm. see those kind of fidelity no. jumps anymore because everything's fairly realistic and it's kind of just like you know iteration upon iteration of that. So like, yeah, like just mind blowing things like uh, uh, connect those types of weird things that like you have to kind of see to believe on a screen. Like those things were the neat things that. Yeah, I, and and like, it's the weird thing because if you're there seeing it live, it probably has more meaning than watching a, a trailer. But like you know, that's people can, more people can access those types of things now. But is it the same? No. But you know, is it cost effective? Probably. And that's maybe yeah. what we're getting into next time. <laughs> I thought even like watching a video, a pre-recorded video, even of, well, not pre-recorded, a live uh, watching a video later of someone doing something live and announcing something live is just a bit more exciting than watching that that video reveal so like the xbox series x reveal comes to mind really cool effects like the the xbox floating or whatever it was and then it kind of appeared like this is the box but it's forgettable like it's like like a bunch of money probably went into that it's nowhere near as cool as peter moore just walking on stage and rolling up his sleeve being like halo 2 and then gta 4 like that was i mean dorky and goofy now but like memorable right yeah and even reggie just pulling out the ds from his pocket being like new new platform guys like Super memorable, and yeah. that's probably the the level of announcement we can't get again. That's what E three allowed it. Well, uh, that was probably part of it as well. Is those things would be leaked now, whereas at the time, yeah. I don't think there was any leak about like um, the DS coming out or anything. Maybe there was kind of murmurs about it. Uh, so it allowed for that level of really cool and iconic and memorable announcement, even though yeah. it's just some guy taking something out of his well, oversized jacket. And polished, thought-out marketing campaigns, of course, but, like, a level of polish, like, a level of a lack of polish as well. Like, Reggie Pohl's thing yeah. from Pocket isn't the same as, you know, like, it'd be a pre-recorded video from Nintendo now with, like, Adobe After Effects graphics and everything flying around. Like, it's, yeah, it's a... I feel like an old man. It was a different time back then. It was but, a different time. But that's why we needed it. That why was, that's why it was super important. And uh, yeah, next week, let's get into why it probably became a little less important and maybe why publishers haven't rushed back in 2023. We'll see no, you then. Exactly. Uh, have a good time currently in Tokyo. Future present, oh, yeah. Ben. I'm, that's right. I'm <laughs> off for some ramen and then I'm, I'm back to chat next week about E3 all over again.